Uh, Michael Bendersky is a senior staff software engineer at Google Research. Um, he's currently managing a research group that focuses on applying machine learning techniques to content search and discovery. Uh, Michael got his PhD from CIR here at UMass and um, has published over 80 articles in peer reviewed conferences and journals. Um, he has been uh, in the program committee and organization committee on multiple conferences, including CIR, CIKM, Wisdom, WWW, KDD, and ICTER. He has co authored two books as part of the Foundations and Trends in Information Retrieval series and has organized tutorials in CIGAR 2015, 2019, ICTIR 2019, and Wisdom 2022. And they were mostly on the topics of verbose query understanding, neural learning to rank, search and discovery in personal email collections. Um, and I think without further ado, I would like to hand the mic virtually to Michael. Um, so you want to talk about neural models for learning to rank. Please join me with a round of applause. I think there were some questions about shared screen. Uh, let me see if I can reshare. It seems that the problem is solved. You can start. Can, can, can Foxy now? Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ahmed. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the seminar. Uh, a lot of people I admire gave talks here, so it's a great privilege to give a talk. Uh, I'd like to preface by uh, saying that this uh, talk would not be possible without my co-author. There's a lot of people to thank here, so I won't go to each one of them, but uh, really this is a group work and I would like to thank all my collaborators, co-authors over the past several years that made this work possible. Uh, the outline of the talk is as follows. Uh, I'll start with giving a very brief introduction to learning to rank and what I mean by saying learning to rank. Um, and then I'll cover two sort of large uh, topics. One is uh, comparing the performance of neural rankers to GDBTs, graded boosted decision trees. Uh, and two large language models for ranking. Those are gonna be the big topics I'm gonna cover today uh, in terms of research. And then in the part four of this uh, talk, I will talk a little bit about the open source software uh, for TensorFlow and JAX that we released to support our research on neural learning to rank. And then finally, I'll conclude with some emerging topics and interesting uh, uh, work we've done in this area that might be sort of interesting to further explore. Uh, as we discussed, I'll take questions at the end. Uh, I think it'll be easier. I'll try to keep the talk at 45, 50 minutes and then I'll leave plenty of time for questions. Okay, so first of all, a uh, very brief introduction to learning to rank. Uh, I think the audience here should know this, so I'll just keep it very brief. Uh, so first of all, learning to rank uh, can apply to any sort of ranking uh, application and those applications are fundamental to many, many machine learning problems, right? From recommendation system to machine translation to question answering to conversational search and even fields like computational biology. There's a lot of papers that explore ranking for different applications. So I would say that ranking is fundamental and foundational to many uh, computer science problems. Uh, in this talk, I particularly focus on the ad hoc information retrieval applications of ranking, but I think the ideas in general uh, would apply to other domains as well. So what I mean by learning to rank for information retrieval, uh, excuse my diagramming skills here, but basically we, we assume a simple uh, architecture that a lot of people use. Uh, some people call it cascade model where we have a corpus, we have a query that retrieves multiple candidates uh, from the system. Uh, there could be multiple retrieval systems, there could be you know, things, things like lexical retrieval, semantic retrieval, and so on. But at the end of the day, we are left with some set of high-ranked candidates, uh, let's say K, and this K can be something like 100 or 1,000 in typical applications. And then the learning to rank methods, this is what I'm gonna focus on, applies to these top K uh, documents, let's call them, or items, 
such that we will rank them in the best order of relevance. So the green here indicates relevance. So the greenest item is the most relevant one. Uh, so basically, the the goal of learning to rank in these applications is to optimize the user utility of the ranked list by placing the most relevant documents at the top. So how do we achieve this, right? Uh, there are multiple techniques that have been developed for learning to rank. I think the starting point were things that we uh, call kind of pointwise learning to rank methods, where documents are considered independently of each other. So in, in some sense, we predict the probability of a document being relevant for each document independently, and that's sort of a classification problem. This can be uh, solved using things like ordinal regression also, and other things, right? So in, in, in some sense, we predict the probability of an item being relevant. Application. In the pairwise setting, which is a, I think more familiar setting for everyone, is we can see a document pairs. And basically, in some sense, we predict instead of predicting a probability of document being relevant, we predict the probability of document one, let's say, being better than document two, and so on for all the pairs. And the goal is to basically uh, minimize discordances in ranking such that all the documents that win most of these comparisons are being ranked on top. And again, there are a lot of examples of um, machine learning methods that do this, including RankNet, RankSDM, and others. In this talk, I will focus mostly on the list-wise methods, which I think consider to be state-of-the-art uh, in many cases. And those approaches, as they sound, they focus on the list of documents. So we take uh, a function or some sort of a, uh, feature representation of all the documents at the ranked list. And then we try to find the best possible pie, uh, best possible permutation of these documents such that the most relevant documents would be at the top. Uh, and again, some examples include state-of-the-art models like Lambda Mark, Appropriate CG, ListNet, and so on. Uh, I think we would be remiss uh, if we didn't talk about evaluation metrics because those are key to understanding why uh, learning to rank is set up the way it is. And basically, for evaluation, we looked at the ranked list. And that's why when we talk about least-wise uh, learning to rank methods, they usually try to approximate some least-based evaluation metric. These least-based evaluation metrics, again, usually focus on some top K evaluation. So look at some top K results. And generally uh, can be described the metrics as some summation over the ranks, top K ranks, uh, over gain over a discount function. And again, you know, NDCG can be easily presented this way. We can also think of a metric like MRR presented this way. If we assume only one uh, single relevant document per query, we can also present it this way. So keep in mind, we're going to keep uh, using those uh, notations, uh, Q meaning the query, K meaning the top K documents, and gain and discount meaning the gain uh, we get from uh, putting the document D at position R, and discount is the discount related to position of the document D. Yeah, no, the discount is not actually document dependent. It depends on the rank only, but the gain may depend on the position and the document itself. Um, so the interesting thing about ranking metrics is they are either discontinuous or flat everywhere. And so they cannot be directly optimized with techniques such as stochastic gradient descent, right? So to showcase this is an example of an indicator function that shows what happens when, let's say, we flip two documents in their ordering. What will happen is that basically, uh, we have a step function, which cannot be optimized using a method like uh, stochastic gradient descent. So when we try to optimize this metric, it's really important to try to approximate them and to make them somewhat smooth or continuous. Uh, to this uh, end, there were several sort of least-wise methods uh, proposed. I'm going to, again, go a very brief overview over these methods. Uh, one popular least-wise loss, and I'm going to mention it, quite a bit during presentation is what we call listness, listnet or softmax, which basically looks at the cross entropy between the true label distribution and score distribution at the top K ranks. Uh, so here we sum over the D in the top K ranks. Uh, in some sense, it tries to sort of approximate the true ordering of the document uh, by trying to compare the actual uh, ordering of the document uh, and achieve it by sort of providing a plotted loss distribution over the top ranks. Another popular uh, least wise loss is lambda mark, uh, which injects this uh, ij, delta ij uh, 
term, which basically looks at the difference in gain over the discount that would be gained by flipping two items and then plugging them into a pairwise uh, setting. So in some sense, the lambda mark loss uses a pairwise loss, but weights, weights the losses by the sort of the effect it will have on the entire list. And some sense, it's some sort of a hybrid between a pairwise loss and the least wise loss. Another interesting method uh, is approx NCG, uh, or we can approximate any other metrics, uh, any other metric, which in some sense tries to approximate this uh, I, so this uh, uh, indicator function uh, that says what happens when we rank one item on top of the other item. So in some sense, it uses the, uh, the observation that a rank can be viewed as a summation of all the indicator functions that introduce that this item is above another item, right? So the rank of the item is basically how many competitions that item it wins. So if we instead approximate this uh, I function with a smooth, with a sigmoid function, we basically get the approximate CG. And so we optimize this sigmoid function uh, instead of optimizing the direct NCG, which again is impossible to optimize uh, with, uh, uh, with stochastic gradient descent. So this, in some sense, approximates or smooths out the NCG function. And there are you know, many variants of this, again, applying to different metrics or also other ways of approximating the indicator function. So I talked a lot about learning to rank in general, but I want to give here a definition of what I mean by neural learning to rank, since from now on, I will mostly dive into the neural world. And simply put, uh, neural learning to rank can be loosely defined as neural network architectures with uh, query group list inputs optimized with the least twice loss. So we assume that the inputs are not just individual items, but they are based uh, on a query. So we have a query and a list of candidates. And then we assume that when we optimize the overall loss of the entire network, we use a least twice loss. Uh, so in some sense, neural learning terrain can be viewed as a specific association of a general learning terrain uh, using neural nets. And a lot of the techniques I discussed, a lot of loss I discussed, uh, can be directly applied in the neural setting. Okay, so I'll move on to the first uh, neural part of this talk, uh, which is about the neural rankers and whether they still uh, uh, outperform by GDBTs uh, or value boost decision trees. Uh, before I start, there's a little bit of history here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I think for many, many years, uh, techniques like Lambda Mart and G other great decision trees techniques were considered state of the art in the uh, learning to rank for AR community. They won a lot of competitions and they used by a lot of uh, search engines. And so we actually want to, in this paper, qualify whether the neural learning to rank research actually is making real progress and whether we are in fact achieving outperform, outperformance compared to these GDBT methods. So for this, we want to conduct a sort of fair benchmark study that looks at three largest publicly available learning terrain data sets. So those learning terrain data sets, they have the following properties. Uh, they focus specifically on numerical and derived features. So these data sets represent each item as a list of some uh, numbers. And each of these uh, data sets has around, uh, you know, approximately in order of magnitude, you know, tens of thousands of queries uh, overall with each query having a list of hundred to a thousand documents. Uh, we uh, look at two publicly available GDBT implementations, rank leap and LiveGBM. Uh, there are other implementations and in, in the paper we actually discuss uh, some of the other implementations uh, as well. Uh, but those are, I think, the, the most popular ones, at least in the IR community. And then we also compare them to the selected neural rankers that are either were recently published or are very popular. So when we do this benchmarking study, we found a very interesting uh, uh, observation. So first of all, uh, there's a very large gap between GDBT implementation. So Lambda Mart in RankLib is very, very inferior to the Lambda Martin GBM. And that kind of makes sense because the Lambda, uh, Lambda Martin rank leap implementation is a, quite an old one uh, done by uh, actually CIR alum. Uh, it hasn't been you know, optimized since. 
uh, Lambda Mar uh, YGBM is actually has been updated and you know it, it may be considered state of the art in some sense. So you know a lesson to anyone here: do not report numbers on Lambda Mar, frankly, because they tend to be very very uh, low compared to other you know say modern uh, GDBT implementations. So that's one observation, but that's beside the point. The second observation is that even in this world of comparing to rank lib, many of the uh, proposed neural rankers are actually inferior or comparable to this uh, low baseline, right? So we can find that techniques uh, such as approximate CG, which were found to be quite popular, are actually on par or slightly better or slightly worse than the rank lib implementation. And other techniques are actually even worse than that. And when compare those techniques to the LIGB implementation, they're way behind. And again, this has been reported before in the papers, but this is an interesting study to sort of validate this. So in some sense, making progress on neural learning to rank requires some thought about what do we need to get to the point where we are actually competitive with traditional, let's call it traditional uh, uh, GDBT implementations. So we thought about what are actually issues with existing neural net rankers. Why are they performing so badly compared to GDBT where in other domains, uh, we know that neural, rank, neural techniques in general outperform other machine learning methods. Uh, so one is uh, neural models are quite sensitive to feature uh, transformations. And so we need to make sure that we design them such that they are not sensitive to input scales and different transformations of the features. And I'll explain how we do it in a, in a minute. Uh, second is the general architectures people use. So the standard uh, connected networks are not very good at generating high order feature interactions, whereas uh, techniques like Lambda Mart uh, and other GBT methods are excellent at that, uh, right? Because they generate these uh, decision trees that combine multiple features uh, into a decision path. And uh, third is obviously the fact that these are relatively small data sets. We, as I said before, have tens of thousands of examples, not you know, millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of examples as in other neural uh, uh, applications. And so really one technique that we want to explore is the technique of data augmentation and synthetic data generation to help uh, neural models learn better. Um, for this, we uh, propose a framework that's called the SALC, very intuitive name, uh, data augmented self-attentive latent cross ranking network, which tries explicitly to address these uh, three weaknesses I mentioned before. So this is the general architecture and I'll go through the architecture uh, in, in a few steps. So uh, the first part of it is this idea of uh, transformation. We discussed the idea of feature transformation uh, just before. We wanna make sure that we transform the features in such a way that the neural networks can optimize their learning. And we actually had a paper about this as well, about you know, different techniques for feature transformation. Uh, what we found here is that uh, a very simple technique called log 1p transformation is quite uh, useful. It basically takes the uh, uh, absolute value of the feature uh, and you know, logs it with a 1 plus, right? So it does 1 plus the absolute value of the feature. Uh, and that's pretty much the log one p transformation. What we're doing is as well is we add uh, this noise uh, where uh, uh, we add the long tail uh, distribution of uh, Gaussian noise. So let me step back and explain here, right? So what we do here is we first take the feature and uh, move it to some sort of transform space where this differentiation is, is better. Um, this addresses things like features that have very, very uh, skewed distributions, right? So in some cases like, uh, let's say, uh, page rank, the features may have very, very long or long tail distribution. And so doing this log one P transformation, taking the absolute value of the feature plus one, doing log of that, and then applying you know, plus or minus sign based on the feature value uh, actually helps with, uh, making the distribution more learnable for neural nets. 
And the second one, we apply this noise of the Gaussian to generate multiple instances of this uh, example. So in some sense, we, from each example, we generate multiple transform examples where we first normalize the features and then add some noise to them. Uh, so this is kind of a, both um, a noise augmentation as well as feature transformation technique. The second part of this is what we call uh, least-wise context. So what we do here is we uh, build the self-attention network for all documents. And so this uh, network is permutation equivariant. And so we, in some sense, look at the set of the retrieved document as a, uh, some sort of a feedback that we provide uh, to the ranker. So this actually touches upon one uh, weakness of uh, GDBTs or tree-based models where they do not, they cannot easily sort of accommodate uh, modeling the context of other documents when they rank a single document. And in some way, it mimics the sort of pseudo relevance feedback techniques used in other IR applications. Um, so once we have this uh, self-attention layer, uh, we feed this together with the document representation into the latent cross. Latent cross basically crosses between this uh, you know, self-attention representation of all the documents in the list with the document representation itself using the very simple uh, element-wise multiplication. And so it gives us two things. One, it provides higher order interactions between different features of the document and other documents. Uh, and two, it actually provides higher interaction between different features as well. So this is a kind of a nice way to model both feature interactions and document interactions. And then uh, finally, uh, this is all fed into a sort of a ranking loss uh, head. Here we use a softmax or least net loss that optimizes this whole thing end to end. Um, one interesting thing, and again, I'll, I'll get back to this ensemble uh, idea in the next uh, part of the talk as well, is that the model ensembles uh, multiple instantiation of the same model, right? Because when you do the neural net, we can you know, easily uh, create multiple runs by random initialization of the parameters. And so what we in fact do, we average the score of all the model runs to create this ensemble uh, model. And so the ensemble model is, is simply an average of over you know, n different model runs. So let's look at the results. Uh, with the non-ensemble approach, the salt line, we achieve pretty much uh, either uh, you know, equivalence or slightly better or slightly worse in some cases with the Lambda Mar GBM. So we are doing much, much better than other uh, previously proposed uh, learn to rank techniques in the neural setting. That's you know, already very uh, satisfying. When we introduce this ensemble model, uh, where we basically combine multiple basalt models together, uh, we do get, in some cases, this cause significant improvements over the live GBM uh, performance. Um, and we actually have some comparisons to ensembles of lambda mar GBM. The ensembles of lambda mar GBM are actually not as effective as the basalt ensembles. Um, one thing that uh, we found is that on Yahoo dataset, we're not performing as well. Uh, one intuition here is that Yahoo dataset actually was actually normalized already pre-release. And that normalization may not be the optimal normalization for uh, neural networks that we propose, uh, which is this log one feature transformation. And so, uh, you know, recommendation here is that, you know, when we do release data sets, we should not normalize them. We should leave it up to the you know, model developers to normalize them. Uh, we also look at the Estelle data set, uh, which is kind of the newest data set of all these three, uh, to see how much we can do when we add all of the different um, uh, layers into the basalt model, right? So when you start with a simple DNN model um, at NDCJ5, we achieve 64. And then as we go and add more and more uh, features, so one is the log one feature transformation, the other one is the um, the data augmentation and then the LC, which is the latent cross. Uh, and then 
uh, the, uh, sorry, the SA is the, is the self attention, and then we add the latent cross, and then we add the dead augmentation. Each of them provides significant boost to performance. And then finally, the ensemble provides the biggest boost. Um, so overall, we see that there is a framework here to, you know, in a, in a series of simple steps uh, to basically make any uh, neural model better by introducing the simple uh, solutions. Right. I'll uh, move on to the second sort of big uh, research part of this talk, which is the uh, large language models for ranking. And this uh, section includes uh, some of the work we've done in this area. Uh, some of these papers are still in the preprint stage. And there's uh, one um, uh, paper from Geek here that I'm going to talk about here. So uh, this section is mainly based on what we call TFR BERT. Uh, which is simply a BERT implementation with a ranking loss. All right, so uh, for now, we'll forget about terminology like example list with context and TF ranking. I'm going to touch upon this uh, in a few slides. But what's happening here is that we receive a query and a list of documents as inputs. Um, we then transform them into this form where we uh, feed them to BERT. Um, uh, query doc pairs. Uh, each of those pairs will generate representation for BERT. And then we take the CLS tokens from those representation and then put them, sort of propagate them into a scoring model, which is then optimized with the ranking loss. Uh, so in some sense, this is, you can think of it as a BERT implementation, BERT fine tuning, where we use a uh, listwise loss. And the representation of the documents are still sort of, um, uh, take the query into account as uh, we sort of attend, the bird attends to both the query and the document. Uh, one uh, important thing to note about this technique is that it doesn't really generalize to large, uh, long lists. So if you have a list of, let's say, a thousand documents, what we would do is we would generate these tuples of you know, three to five documents. And then for each tuple, we'll optimize it with a ranking loss. But the ranking loss will not be applied to the entire uh, thousand documents. So it's some of the limitation of the current, you know, BERT uh, memory, uh, but it does work well in practice. Uh, so as I mentioned, the model is basically uh, fine-tuned using the self mod loss, which is the cross-entropy between the true labels and the labels uh, assigned by the BERT model. Um, and what we found is that when we use this softmax loss, we achieve much better performance or somewhat better performance than the uh, pairwise or pointwise method. Uh, but again, what works the best is actually ensembling all of these different methods together, uh, you know, both the softmax, the pairwise, and the sigmoid, and as well taking different initiations of these uh, losses. And so what we see is that when we do the ensembling, we get you know, much better results on tasks like kind of smart capacity re-ranking, which is where this model was first tested. Um, this sort of led us to explore a little bit the idea of uh, ranker variance and ranker ensembling uh, in the BERT setting. All right, so we just showed, and you know, previous work also shows that ranking models based on BERT and its variant achieve pretty much better performance in different uh, text ranking benchmarks. But there is still like a very large variance of BERT uh, performance um, when we look across even the same model, but initialized with different parameters, right? So here on the right-hand side, you see a graph that shows that we can get a pretty large differences. Uh, so, you know, somewhere between uh, 393 and 401 uh, for the same model with different parameters, right? So it's a huge gap of performance uh, that would really, you know, affect whether you achieve state of the art results or not. Uh, and so intuitively, it makes sense to ensemble all of these uh, models together, which A, improves overall performance, and B, reduces variance in the performance. So again, look at the right-hand side uh, graph here. You see that the single model, as before, has a huge variance. But, but when we take basically five different runs and, and ensemble them together, the ensemble of these five runs, and here we take a couple of random ensembles, A, usually outperform the average single method, 
and B have a very uh, much smaller variance, which is a very good thing for this. So, you know, sampling tends to work. Um, we sort of demonstrate on, the, on uh, uh, two tasks. Uh, two tasks. Uh, one is sort of zero shot task where we take the MS Markov fine tune model and basically fine tune it 30 different times uh, on MS Markov and then apply it to track COVID as a basically a zero shot uh, setting. So here we have different uh, BERT model or you know, BERT style models, uh, BERT, Electra, Roberta. And again, different initialization for each of the models. So we have uh, 10 initialization for each model. We then feed into simple uh, reciprocal rank fusion, then use that prediction to uh, basically re-rank using uh, track of the data. That's a zero shot setting of the ensemble. Um, we also have a fine tuning setting of the ensemble where we fine tune using uh, QRLs from previous rounds of track COVID, uh, using again three different types of uh, large language models, BERT, Electron, and Roberta, six instantiation of each of these uh, runs, uh, and then again apply rank fusion to, to rank. Uh, and then here we, we always evaluate using the last round of uh, track COVID. What we found is that. Actually, both the uh, the fine-tuned uh, MS Marco fine-tuned bird and the track COVID bird uh, give you know big gains in performance uh, compared to just using the retrieval systems. Uh, and again, we have more analysis to show that we do much better than using uh, you know individual run versus uh, ensemble. So ensemble always does better than any individual run you would take. And yeah, this approach of ensembling a lot of different techniques uh, was actually the best performing approach at the round five of the track COVID competition. However, I mean, if you think about it, ensembles are nice on paper, but they are really, really expensive to serve, right? So you would want to serve, if you want to serve an ensemble of N BERT models, you really want to take uh, N uh, running times of each birds and add all of these latency to your system as well as sort of compute resources. So not, not very uh, delightful. So the basic idea here is that, you know, distillation is a very well-known technique. Can we use the ensemble results to be teacher labels and then train a single student model uh, that can then predict uh, better than any individual, um, you know, uh, model in the teacher ensemble? There are a couple of research questions here that you know we wanted to explore. Uh, one is how do we transform the each teacher model's output scores? How do we aggregate across multiple models? And again, which losses we should be using? And it's more mostly empirical evaluation here. So if you think about it, there are two ways to sort of uh, distill the ensemble, right? So one is what we call the aggregate teacher model, where we take all the student models, and then we aggregate them using some technique, let's say averaging, and then use that averaging as a teacher label. So there's only one teacher label in some sense to, to teach the student. The second technique is the multi-object technique where instead of aggregating them, we actually let the student learn from, you know, uh, in this case, let's say three different uh, labels uh, through multitasking, right? So we are not, making the student learn from the average of the teacher labels, but learn from all teacher labels and figure out things by itself. Um, there are also the question of what are the type of teacher labels we should use. So we can use the scores, uh, which has the benefit of, you know, preserving predicted relevance for each document, um, but, you know, can be somewhat uh, dangerous in, let's say, a transfer learning setting where scores may be very different. Or just using the reciprocal ranks. Uh, so this could be more robust again in the transfer learning setting or when we have different base model that we apply. And then again, the third question is distillation loss, uh, right? So what do we want the teacher to teach the student or what do you want the student to learn, right? Do you want to student to minimize the distance between teacher label uh, or do we want to do like a list-wise optimization where we basically want the student to predict the order in which the teacher would rank these results, right? 
So it's very similar to the general uh, least first order. Least first setting. Just instead of this time around, the teacher labels or the predictions of the ensemble are used as labels, and we try to basically teach the student that you know we want to order these labels in the same way. So overall, again, we find that uh, the average or you know some sort of uh, reciprocal rank fusion ensemble, these are the lines uh, three and four here, are always you know better or comparable to even the best of the rankers, and they're definitely better than the just average of the base rankers. So it's always good again you know, to verify here that it's always good to sort of uh, ensemble things together. Um, what we also find is that through installation, we can achieve comparable results to the uh, ensemble itself. And here we actually denote the best ensemble performance. And in the next slide, um, it, these are the uh, basically comparisons of different uh, variants of the ensemble model, right? So here, the best performance that we found uh, happens to be the one that uses ranking scores as teachers, as teacher labels, uh, uses multi-objective, so non-aggregated distillation uh, strategy, and uses softmax entropy as the loss. Uh, that achieves the best performance, which again, it actually slightly outperforms, not significantly, but slightly outperforms the uh, actual reciprocal rank fusion ensemble, which is quite, quite nice. Um, what we do see as well is that in general, mean squared error loss. So pointwise loss is not a very good way to teach your uh, student. Uh, the results are usually not as good as the softmax cross entropy. So again, uh, another sign that leastwise loss is not only important for sort of when you learn from true labels, but it's also important when you learn from you know, some derived teacher labels. Um, Again, another thing that we found uh, repeatedly is that ensembles and distillation in this case make much better um, and much more robust uh, performances than the sort of individual rankers. So here we again uh, distilled um, the base model several times uh, and then you know look at the uh, this different distillation model we achieve from that. And we see that there is a again, much smaller variance in their performance and they usually outperform the best performing ranker and they always are like significantly outperform the average of the base rankers. So which is again, quite nice. Right. So we're kind of reaching the uh, tail end of the talk. And here I want to focus a little bit more on the software. Um, we released over the years. Uh, over the last several years, we've been working on several open source projects that tries to democratize access to these neural models for learning to rank. And I'm going to talk about some of these projects in the next slides. Uh, the first project is uh, TF ranking. Uh, many of you might know about this. It's a uh, we call a deep learning library for learning to rank in TensorFlow. It has been on GitHub since 2018. Uh, we still actively work on this, and there have been a couple of you know Google AI blog posts uh, describing the use cases and applications and you know advances and so on. It also uses we also use this sort of repository for our development. So much of the work that I just described, including um, the work on the Salk and uh, TFR Bird, is included in the you know the TF ranking uh, GitHub. Uh, page. And I want to give a shout out to the Sierra Lab and the folks who contributed to the antique data set, which is used in many uh, uh, in many of the tutorials that we provide on the site. So thank you for providing the antique data set. It's been very valuable in uh, providing a release data set that's still sort of um, scalable enough to, to put in the call app. So thank you. Um, in addition to the sort of the open source uh, world and research world, the TF ranking is used by many uh, industrial companies. So those are just the ones that we know of. Uh, you know, companies like Linking, Grubhub, Spotify, and others uh, use TF ranking in their uh, production systems. 
So why do you want to do learning to rank in TensorFlow? I think the answer is you know, pretty clear. There's a lot of uh, things that standard learn to rank libraries like LightGBM don't provide. So sparse features, uh, first of all, is the you know, notion of using directly query and document keywords as features. That's kind of the TFR BERT work I talked about, which are very difficult, if not impossible, to do using uh, GDBTs. Uh, using very large scale data, right? So we can scale to billions interactions and clicks. And also again, we can take advantage of the advancements in the deep learning technologies like uh, transformers, BERT, uh, more recently even larger model like you know, T5 and even larger variants of that. Uh, so basically as long as the, there's imp imp implementation of this model in TensorFlow, uh, we can plug in you know, least waste losses and try it out on ranking columns. Um, when we developed TF ranking, the team was tackling a few challenges that are kind of interesting from the maybe engineering perspective. One is data representation. In, in fact, you know, the question of how to represent a document at least of varying size was not very clear uh, when we started working on this. Uh, TF examples uh, is not a very suitable format for a list. It, by definition provides an example. And TF Tensor is not a very friendly format for varying size. And so we came up with this new format, ELWC, example list with context, which is a format that tailors specifically for ranking problems, uh, which as the name says, it uses a list of documents uh, as a context to a particular query, right? We just use it as an example with some context where the context are the documents for that query. Um, we also built in, uh, there, there are basically right now no built in uh, ranking losses in TensorFlow beyond uh, TF ranking. And so one of the main goals of TF ranking was developing a lot of standard point pair and least wise losses and standard AR metrics into TF ranking so that people can, can easily compare and contrast their results to you know, prior work. And again, many of the papers that we have, we uh, you know, use that and we also thoroughly compare those results to prior work as well to verify that you know, our results are compatible with what was reported before. Uh, another challenge that's kind of interesting and specific to ranking is that the serving of the model may be very different from training, right? So if you think about it during training, we need the whole list of documents. So we need to you know, optimize the list of loss. But in serving many times, we actually only get a single document at a time. So we have a query and we have a document that comes in and we have to score it at, uh, individually. And so we provide uh, the support for customized input functions that allow you to, let's say, train a least wise model, but then at scoring time, score each document individually using the loss uh, that was trained on the you know, list of examples. Um, it, it is more complicated for some models than others, but you know, it works for most of the models that I presented here. Okay, so in general, TF ranking works uh, as follows. We have this ELWC format, which has a query and a list of documents as well, associated labels for each document. Uh, then we provide sort of an opportunity to plug in any scoring function you'd like. You know, TFR bird is one example of a scoring function. You can provide a DNN or other types of scoring functions. Um, and then once we output the uh, sort of labels for each document, we can optimize the loss for these labels using a variety of losses. And then again, we also provide metrics like MECG, MAP, MRR, and so on. So you can validate your model uh, as it trains in real time uh, to the metric that you, uh, that is of interest to you. So it's different from a classification metrics in some cases, right? Um, one thing I want to touch on, uh, which is a kind of a new development, and I think it's pretty exciting, is this library called Rex which is a composable learning to rank using JAX. Uh, so JAX is a newer development than TensorFlow, but it's been proven to be very, very uh, popular. Uh, it provides an API for writing accelerated uh, numerical code. It sort of provides uh, notions of differential programming you know, through function transformations. And many of the recent sort of language model uh, are available again in this framework like T5X is very popular these days. So in Rex, we took the same approach as we took in TF ranking. And we said, you know, we want to be able to offer ranking functionality 
losses and metrics in Jax. And you want to provide, again, a very systematic way of doing optimization of uh, ranking metrics in Jax using the function transformations that Jax provides. Um, this is currently open sourced in github.com uh, Google Rex. Uh, we haven't advertised it very uh, aggressively yet, but this is a shout out if you want to try it out, it's already available. We will probably do more advertising on this soon. Um, just a few examples. Uh, we try to make it very easy to write sort of learning to rank using JAX. And basically, here's an example of how we can uh, basically optimize uh, metric using, uh, optimize, let's say, the list of documents using softmax laws. So we have here labels, scores. Uh, we can compute NCG metric very easily. We can then sort of do the softmax loss and we can optimize the softmax loss. Um, another really cool feature of Rex is that we actually provide uh, differential approximations of metrics by a function transformation, which means that we can take any ranking function, uh, any sorry, ranking metric like NCG or MAP or other things, and basically apply an approximation to it, which is very similar to the approximate CG I discussed before, and then sort of make that metric optimizable, right? So here's an example shows that we cannot directly optimize the NCG metric because you see the gradients are zero. Uh, but if you apply an approximation to it, it actually can start becoming optimizable. And the nice thing about this is that you can approximate any ranking metric, right? So here, you see that we take approximate loss as a rex dot approx t12n on rex and g metric. So you can potentially use any other metric as input here as well. A very nice way to think about optimization here. All right. So this is nearing the end of the talk. I'm going to just very briefly touch upon some emerging topics in neural learning to rank. Some of this work was published by uh, my lab, and some of this work. Uh, is still in progress, uh, but I think these are all interesting topics that uh, you know, uh, warrant more exploration. Um, one, I think, important problem in neural learning to rank is interpretability. How do we make the models interp interpretable? So, so how do we make them more understandable to the users? Uh, we've done some work on this. Uh, we call this uh, models neural GANs. It's just the idea of trying to apply uh, the ideas of GAM, general additive models that separate the features uh, into singular functions uh, to the world of neural nets with additional focus on sort of context. In this case, context can be a query. Um, again, I'm not going to go into too much details here, but we show that these generalized additive models can provide interpretability while also being quite compatible and quite comparable to sort of uh, non interpretable models. Uh, they also can perform much better as interpretable models than the existing alternatives that are not uh, neural. I talked a little bit about context awareness. We had a sort of a, a paper on this as well. So the idea here is that we want to learn from document sets. Uh, and so in some sense, we want to use this notion of two relevance feedback when we do learning to rank. We want to be able to take the self-attention uh, ideas and apply it to list of documents and then use this uh, self-attention list of documents uh, to actually better represent each individual document score. And again, we use this idea in the result and we have a separate uh, paper that talks about this. In some notion, this context awareness is one thing in which neural networks are probably are more powerful at than you know, things like GDPs. So this becomes a very important uh, feature of neural learning to rank. Uh, finally, we have some uh, interesting preliminary work on diversification aware neural learning to rank. So, you know, as we all know, diversity is an important problem, and we want to be able to not just show relevant results, but also show diverse results. Uh, in this work, we show that th there is a way to actually use this idea of approximation that I mentioned before that we applied to NCG and apply it to uh, approximation metrics such as alpha NCG or ERR IA. And so basically the idea is that again, it uses the idea of context. So we represent this document using some uh, 
distributed representation, and then we score the document using document itself and the features of other documents while optimizing this uh, alpha NCG ERRIA metric. And we show that it really provides state of the art results uh, for these metrics. Again, these type of things are really difficult to do using non neural uh, learning to make methods. Uh, finally, I'll conclude with some future directions. Uh, one interesting thing, and I think it's really crucial for applications where document priors are important, like you know web search and things like that, is uh, doing joint learning to learn that takes into account both sparse text labels, uh, sparse text data, uh, and tabular data, so numerical data, right? So you can think of it as, you know, in, in a web search, we want to both optimize the quality of the presented documents and their page rank, uh, but also we want to uh, be able to learn neural models uh, over the data of, of the text of the documents. Uh, I think this is a very important research direction for which I think more collections need to be built, and this is something that is quite promising. Um, Second, we've shown some preliminary results that show that data transformation augmentation is an important, uh, an important technique. And the current collection we have may be too small for meaningful progress, especially for the what we call tabular data or numerical data. And so devising more advanced models compared to what we've shown is a very important research question. And then finally, I think on sampling, we just question the surface of what we can do, right? So we haven't explored things like query dependent ensembles or sparse uh, mixtures of experts as, at all for ranking. I think there's a lot of room for uh, growth and opportunity here. Okay, with this, I'll stop. Thank you very much for attending the talk. Uh, here, there are some links to the software we provide, TensorFlow Ranking, TFR Bird, and Rex. Uh, yeah, looking forward to talking to you and your questions. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mike. It was very interesting and also very relevant to uh, the works that we've been doing in CIR in the past few years. Um, so it's, we have some time for q and A. Is there any questions in the audience? So I start from one of the online questions while people think about their questions. Um, so, the one question is, um, is there any plan to release these uh, methods and things that you discussed in PyTorch or is there any available implementation of them in PyTorch? Yeah. Well, not I a mean, question for uh, someone from Google, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we currently don't have plans to uh, release them in PyTorch. We don't you know, work in PyTorch very, very frequently. Uh, I do know that there are a couple of libraries in PyTorch that try to address the learning to rank problems. I have not evaluated them, so I don't know how good they are. Um, but no, we, we don't have, I mean, it's just a matter of you know, uh, resources. We don't have the resources to support uh, PyTorch libraries in addition to TensorFlow and JAX libraries. So, uh, but we do invite you to try out uh, the JAX implementation, especially, uh, which might be more sort of user-friendly than the TensorFlow one. Got it, thanks. Um, so we have one question from the audience. Hello, I have a question about the distillation training. When the student model is trained, how do you select the how do you select the training data? Do you use the only the label data or do you augment unlabeled data for the training? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, right now we for ensembles, we basically use the training data uh, as label data. We don't uh, do any sort of, you know, weak supervision or any supervision using like an ensemble as its feature. Um, what, as I showed in the distillation work, what we do is we uh, basically label the same examples that uh, the that we have labels for. So we don't actually label new examples. We don't, you know, generate new queries and new documents and, and label them. Uh, we use uh, sort of the same label data, but this time we score it using the, the other models and then provide that to the student as like, you know, uh, as the weak labels. So no, we don't actually um, generate any new training data. We use the same data with different labels. 
Okay. So uh, another questions in the chat uh, from Jeremy. Um, I think this question is related to the first part of your uh, presentation. So uh, he's asking, he's curious, what's the difference in the various results that, in terms of NDCG 800 and 500? Basically, I think you showed the results for the top K uh, retrieved results. So what about the deeper ranking metrics? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we ever compare it like that low in the least. I think in general, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, the learning to rank sort of paradigm thinks of things like top results that we show to the user. So we try to optimize uh, very, very top results. Uh, and so in that sense, like a lot of literature and learning to rank has been focusing on, let's say, at five, at 10, at 20, which is kind of like above the full results that you see in search. Uh, I don't have like numbers here. I do expect that the results are somewhat similar, uh, given that in general, what happens is that you know if your model is better at predicting you know very very good results at the top, it should be consistent across the rank list. The difference will, will probably decrease over time because you know if you look at the entire rank list, maybe the difference is not that big. But at the same time, I'm not sure how meaningful is a number like NCG at 500 uh, when you only re rank you know a thousand results. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I see here actually, like maybe I want to ask Jeremy's question. So no recall precision trade-off. Yeah, so just to clarify, right? So we don't actually look at the recall precision trade-off. We assume that the results are given to us and we arrange the given results. We don't actually work in the retrieval paradigm at all. So we assume that the retrieval step is already optimized. And again, there is some other work that tries to look at, you know, how do we optimize retrieval stage and the ranking stage jointly? And that's an interesting question. Uh, but no, in this work, we basically focus on fixed results at the top and then optimize those results using learning to ranking tool. OK, uh, thank you. So the next question in the chat is related to, um, again, the comparison of neural IR with uh, Lambda, Mart, and GBDT. So, the question is, what if we use the output of the neural IR methods as features uh, into the uh, learning to rank models in addition to the manually handcrafted features? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think in this data set, it's kind of difficult because these data sets I present here, like the, the public data set, they don't really have. Uh... So the data sets I present here, they like the MS Marco case, we only have textual features. And in the case of you know, uh, learning terrain data sets like Yahoo or uh, Estella, we only have numerical features. Uh, I think the really, and that's kind of what I touched upon the last bullet point, uh, or the first bullet point in my last slide, is basically the idea that if you have both uh, sparse features, so both textual features and numerical features, uh, a combination of GDBT and the neural network, so let's say neural network takes care of the sparse features and the GDBT takes care of the numerical features and combines everything together may be quite promising. And there is sort of some work on that area. But I think that area is still underexplored just because data sets that would help to sort of explore those models more are not really available publicly. Um, but yes, I think this is a very promising direction of combining GDPs and neural networks. Great, thank you. And the last question um, is about the stability of the methods. The question is, uh, how is the stability of the distilled models compared to the ensemble methods? How is the stability of distilled? Uh, yeah, so I haven't talked about that actually. I talked about the comparison of the, actually, yeah, here. Uh, so here we don't compare to the ensemble itself, we compare the distilled ensembles to the base rankers. Um, I think what the question is asking is whether the ensemble models are more stable than the distilled models. Uh, maybe we have, I don't think we've done this exploration. I think the goal here was not to show that the distilled model can outperform the ensemble. The, the, the goal here was to show that the distilled model can sort of outperform the base model uh, while sort of bringing us close to the performance of the ensemble. So 
it could be that the ensemble model actually might be more stable than uh, these two models. Uh, I don't think we've done this analysis. Okay, I great. This question. Yeah. Okay, so I think time is up. Thanks again, Michael. It was very nice and great talk. Thank and thanks everyone for joining. So let's again, thanks Michael one more time.